Welcome everyone to Ovarian Cancer Canada's speaker series. Tonight, our topic is early cancer detection using cell-free DNA sequencing. My name is Stephanie Goslin. I'm the programs director here at Ovarian Cancer Canada, and it's my pleasure to be here with you this evening uh, as your host. The people joining us today live and work across Turtle Island on the lands that we now collectively call Canada. We recognize and respect that these are the traditional lands of many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities. I personally live, work, and play in Shelburne, Saskatchewan, which is on Treaty 6 territory and is the homeland of the Métis Nation. As an organization, Ovarian Cancer Canada commits to doing all we can to encourage the culturally safe care of all of those affected by ovarian cancer and to use our unique position as a health charity to respond to the calls to action as outlined in the Truce and Reconciliation Commission. It is now my pleasure to welcome our speaker for today, Julia Sabotka. Julia is a research genetic counselor at Princess Margaret Hospital, and she is also the program manager of the CHARM Consortium. CHARM is a pan-Canadian research initiative with the goal to revolutionize the management of patients with hereditary cancer syndromes through the development of a blood test for early cancer detection. Julia has a master's degree in molecular genetics and a master's degree in genetic counseling, both from the University of Toronto. Julia, I wanna thank you so much for being here tonight and I'm gonna pass it over to you. Beautiful. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to talk to everyone a little bit about CHARM and what we do. And um, like Stephanie mentioned at the end, if anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to answer those. Um, but of course, we're in a group setting. So I'll share my contact information and anyone can reach out to me personally with any questions afterwards as well. So I'm just gonna share my screen. And can everyone see that okay? That yeah, looks good. good. Perfect. Um, so just want to start off with a few objectives for this evening, not to make it too much like school, uh, but just some takeaways that I'm hoping I can get across. Um, I will be talking a little bit about the difference between um, what we think of as sporadic cancer versus hereditary cancer. Um, when do we suspect either one? Um, so what are some of the red flags that we look for when we uh, think of hereditary cancer? Um, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about cancer screening and specifically cell-free DNA. What is it um, and how can it we use it in cancer screening? Um, and then lastly, of course, I'm gonna talk a little bit about CHARM, um, which is a research initiative that's led out of UHN. Um, but we are actually across Canada and we have a pretty exciting trial, clinical trial coming up sometime in the next year or so. So I will share a little bit about that um, as well. So uh, I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about what are the causes of cancer. Um, and uh, we kind of in a genetics setting, think of them in kind of three pieces, three chunks as I've outlined here on the pie chart. Um, the numbers I've listed on the slide here are really averages across all cancers. Um, exact numbers will differ a little bit depending on what type of cancer we're talking about, but on average across cancers, about 75% we consider um, what we call sporadic, meaning they really happen by chance. It could be due to some environmental factors and exposures. Age plays a role. So as we get older, we're just more exposed to the environment for longer. That also increases our risk. Um, and there's generally this population risk um, of sporadic cancer. Uh, the next group is what we call familial cancer. Um, so we might see some uh, clusterings of cancers in families because families share both their genetics, but also families often share their environment as well. Um, and both of those contribute to cancer risk. And then the last category, the smallest category is what we consider hereditary cancer or what we call hereditary cancer. So these are cancers that are caused by a single genetic change that can be passed down through families. We can do genetic testing to identify it. And when someone inherits that genetic change from a parent, um, their lifetime risk of cancer and several different cancers increases significantly. 
And this is the group um, that would be referred to a genetics clinic to see a genetic counselor or a genetics doctor and to talk about um, potentially organizing some genetic testing, for example, to identify the genetic cause um, of the cancer in the family. So today I will focus on this group, the hereditary cancer group, but I do wanna stress really a lot of what I talk about is applicable to sporadic cancers. Um, it's just that I work in genetics. So the group that we, and the patient population we work with are individuals who have a hereditary uh, form of cancer. So because we'll be chatting um, about genetics, genes, DNA, um, I have a little bit of a genetics 101 spiel um, to make sure everyone's a little bit on the same page. Um, I think about genes and DNA on a daily basis, but I realize most people do not. Um, so you might know that we are just made up of trillions and trillions of cells. We have our muscle cells, heart cells, skin cells, blood cells. Um, and if you were to take a cell and look under the microscope, so zoom in, you would see inside these structures called chromosomes. And chromosomes are just structures that organize and package our DNA really nicely. And we have two copies of every chromosome, one that we inherit from each parent. So one from mom, one from dad. And essentially, if you were to unwind a chromosome, you would see these smaller units within that are called genes. And we have a lot of genes, over 20,000 different genes, um, and they all have different jobs in our body. And they're really just the instructions that make us us. So our hair color, our eye color, how tall we are, um, they're really important for making sure our systems and organs in our body work properly. And we also have um, a group of genes that play a really important role in our body in preventing cancer. Um, so cancer or tumors happen or can happen when our cells really start to grow and divide too quickly. They just grow and divide out of control and that's what can form a tumor. And we have genes whose primary role is really to tell our cells, hey, slow down, um, don't divide too quickly. So essentially keeping our cells in check. So these are genes that are really important in regulating how our cells grow. Um, and maybe you've come across the word um, tumor suppressor gene or oncogene. Um, these are kind of the scientific names for these genes, but essentially these are just cancer protecting genes. So how does, uh, how does genetics play a role in sporadic cancer or how does sporadic cancer happen? Um, and this is the cancer that really happens by chance um, as we get older and are exposed to our environment. Um, so in sporadic cancer, um, in green, these two sticks here, you can just imagine are two, co uh, uh, two copies of a cancer protecting gene. Um, and we are all born with two working copies. Sometime um, will pass in our life and maybe we're exposed to something in the environment um, and a genetic change will happen in one copy of the gene and that will cause that one copy to stop working properly. But at this point, we still have a backup working copy. Um, so that cell is still protected. That backup copy is doing its job. But then a little bit more time can pass by. And now another, gen another genetic change has happened on that second backup copy. Um, so this cell now does not have any working copies um, of this cancer protecting gene. And as a result, it starts to grow and divide too quickly and can result in a tumor. With hereditary cancer, um, it's a little bit different. So in this case, someone, as you can see on the slide here, will be born with one copy of a cancer protecting gene already not working. Um, so they only have that one backup copy that's keeping the cell in check. So that means that they only in their lifetime need to get one more genetic change in the second copy of that gene to now have no more working copies of this cancer protecting gene leading to a tumor. So as you can maybe imagine, someone with a hereditary cancer syndrome will develop cancers at a younger age um, and are more likely to develop multiple cancers over their course of their lifetime. So their risk is really significantly higher. Here's just a different way of showing what I talked about on the previous slide. So in someone who has um, developed sporadic cancer, most of the cells in their body have two working copies of this cancer protecting gene. Um, and it is only the tumor cells where both copies are not working as they should. And this means that this person's um, egg cells or their sperm cells have a working copy of this gene, so it can't be passed on to the next generation. Versus in someone who has hereditary cancer, one non-working copy is found in all the cells of their body, including their sperm cell or their egg cell. 
And this means that um, this non-working copy can be passed down to their children. And it's really a 50% chance uh, for them to pass down um, this hereditary cancer syndrome to their children. And so I've touched on this a little bit already, um, but on the slide, I'm just highlighting some of the flags that we think about when we think about hereditary cancer. Um, and when we see these things in families or in an individual, we get a little bit more suspicious that there might be a genetic cause or a hereditary cancer syndrome that's running in the family. Um, and this family might be one to benefit from a genetics appointment, to see a genetic counselor and a genetics doctor, um, and really to discuss their options around genetic testing. Um, so I've touched uh, already on the age piece, but um, again, to reiterate, if we see cancer at younger ages than we would expect, we get a little bit more suspicious that there might be a hereditary or genetic cause. Um, I haven't mentioned this yet, but if we uh, see certain types of very rare, unusual tumors, we also get more suspicious of a hereditary cancer. Um, and then if we see a lot of cancer clustering in the family, and there are many family members diagnosed um, with cancer, again, we might be uh, more suspicious. And especially if we have one person diagnosed with multiple cancers of their lifetime, that also makes us more suspicious. Um, and there are certain patterns we also look out for. So there are certain cancer types, um, which I'll talk a little bit about on the next slide, um, that we often see together in certain syndromes. So um, the one cancer syndrome I wanted to elaborate on a little bit more today um, is called hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome, or sometimes we call it HBOC for short. Um, so this is a syndrome that's caused by um, genetic changes in two genes, one of two genes, BRCA1 or BRCA2. So these are two cancer protecting genes that we all have. Um, and I find that these are two genes that people are a little bit more familiar with in part because um, Angelina Jolie has the syndrome herself. So she has a genetic change. Um, she was born with a genetic change in one of these genes and she's very publicly talked about her journey of genetic testing and being a carrier of the syndrome. So it's put these genes and this syndrome into spotlight. Um, and so what I'm showing here is just an example of what a family tree might look like um, in a family where the syndrome is present. Um, so as the name implies, the most common two cancers we see in this syndrome is breast and ovarian. Um, and so you can see here, there are some individuals who have had breast cancer in their 40s and 40s is younger than we would expect for sporadic breast cancer. Now, I do want to stress just because someone has cancer at a young age doesn't automatically mean that they have a genetic cause. It just makes it more likely. It makes us a bit more suspicious. Um, you can see also at the bottom right hand corner, my right, it might be your left. Um, there is someone who's had both breast and ovarian cancer. And actually, when we see someone who's had both breast and ovarian cancer, we particularly get suspicious for them um, having a, a genetic change in one of these two genes, BRCA1 and 2. There are also some other cancers that individuals with the syndrome are at risk of, so it's not just breast and ovarian. Um, men can, for example, get prostate cancer or higher risk of prostate cancer. Um, and then we also see a little bit less frequently melanoma and pancreatic cancer as well. Um, at the bottom here, I've listed the risks um, specific to this syndrome. So um, in the first number, so for example, breast cancer, the 40 to 70%, that's the lifetime risk for someone to develop breast cancer who has the syndrome. Um, in brackets, I've listed the general population risk for breast cancer. So for someone who doesn't have the syndrome, what is the chance that they'll develop breast cancer? So you can see for breast cancer, for someone who has the syndrome, it's up to 70% lifetime risk versus only 12%, or I shouldn't say only, but it's much less for the general population. Um, and the same goes for the other cancers on this list. So for example, ovarian cancer, someone with this syndrome has up to 40% chance of developing ovarian cancer in their lifetime compared to a 1.5% risk for the general population. So quite a significant difference and so on. Um, so individuals in their lifetime, and this is just an example of one cancer syndrome, there are quite a lot, um, but in general, these individuals have really a high risk of a variety of different cancers in their lifetime. And because of this increased risk, um, uh, individuals with the syndrome will be put into um, provincial screening programs for, the, for cancer. Um, I can't comment too much on screening programs done in other provinces. Um, I'm in Ontario and I did my schooling in Ontario, so I really can just comment on what we do here. Um, but one thing we do to mitigate the breast cancer risk, um, individuals will enroll in high risk 
uh, breast screening program. So things like mammogram and breast MRI every year. Um, I believe it's starting at age 25 or 29. I can't quite remember, but it's quite young. Um, for prostate cancer, uh, men will do a PSA, which is a marker in the blood. Um, so it's a blood test as well as a digital rectal exam. Oh, sorry. Um, for melanoma, we'll recommend a um, annual skin exam, either by a family doctor or dermatologist. Um, and you can see that I've listed nothing beside ovarian cancer and pancreatic cancer because there aren't provincial recommendations for the screening of these two cancers or kind of guidelines around this. Um, there aren't really great proven effective screening tools, um, especially in the context for early cancer diagnosis, which is of course always what we're striving for. Um, another thing to mention is that um, women who have uh, the syndrome might choose to have their breasts removed or their ovaries removed um, as another way to quite significantly decrease their risk um, to develop breast and ovarian cancer. So that's another preventative measure that patients take. So um, something we often hear from patients um, who have hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome and other cancer syndromes as well um, is this idea of um, scan anxiety. Um, so I put that in, in the picture here. Um, so patients, you know, annually, biannually, sometimes even more frequently, will go through screening. Um, and the lead up to the screening, the waiting for those results can really produce a lot of anxiety um, and uncertainty for patients. And patients go through this every year, um, really for a majority of their lifetime. Um, and if a patient is diagnosed with cancer and they're treated, because there's still a risk of developing multiple cancers in their lifetime, they'll go back into their screening um, protocols um, and the cycle of anxiety and uncertainty really continues. A few things to keep in mind, um, like I mentioned on the previous slide, some cancers don't have great effective screening tools like ovarian or pancreatic or endometrial cancer is another one. Um, and because individuals who have these hereditary cancer syndromes are often at risk of quite a few different cancer types, um, they will often have to go through really a variety of different screening tests. Um, so scans, blood work um, to assess the risk for the different cancer types. And depending on what the cancer is and depending how difficult or specialized the screening is, it might have to be done at a really specialized center, which might only be located in a big city. Um, and a lot of Canadians, as we know, live in smaller towns or more rural areas. Um, and it can be quite burdensome and disruptive to have to travel to um, quite long distances to get their screening done. So with all this in mind, um, researchers and clinicians are really keen to develop a tool um, to make screening, um, cancer screening, first of all, more accessible to everyone, um, a tool that can screen many cancers all at once. So not that you have one screening type for this cancer and one screening type for that cancer. Um, so really try to simplify. Um, and then a screening um, uh, tool for the cancers that don't have great and effective screening tools right now. So this is where uh, cell-free DNA comes into play. Um, and cell-free DNA, like the name implies, is DNA that's not found inside of our cells. It's cell-free. Um, so in the schematic here, I'm showing a blood vessel. And you can see there are these short pieces of um, DNA floating around in the blood next to some red blood cells. Um, and we all have cell-free DNA in our blood. Most of it comes just from normal healthy cells. So as our cells get older, um, they might die and release these small pieces of DNA into the blood. Um, if someone has a tumor, they will also release cell-free DNA into the blood. Um, and the cell-free DNA from the tumor actually looks a little bit different um, than the cell-free DNA that's coming from healthy cells. So it has these markers or flags on it, which I'm kind of showing here with the little red dot. Um, so what we can do is we can take a blood sample from someone, get out all that cell-free DNA. So we process that blood sample, get that cell-free DNA, and then we sequence or we analyze it um, to look for any flags, markers that look like that might be coming from cancer. 
I've put this slide here um, just because for anyone in the audience who has gone through a pregnancy um, and learned about a test or done themselves a test called NIPT or non-invasive prenatal testing. Um, this is actually a test, um, again, done in pregnancy that also uses cell-free DNA. So it measures the cell-free DNA in mom's blood. Um, and mom's blood will have both her cell-free DNA, but also cell-free DNA that's coming from the baby, specifically the placenta. The purpose of this test is very different. So the purpose of NIPT is to tell parents the chance about their um, the chance that their child will have a chromosome condition like Down syndrome. Um, I don't want to delve too much into NIPT and all that, though. Of course, happy to answer questions. But I just bring this up as an example of how we are already using cell-free DNA to our um, advantage in a clinical setting. And so I want to now introduce CHARM, um, and CHARM stands for um, a bit of a mouthful, cell-free DNA in hereditary and high-risk malignancies. As the name suggests, so we are interested really in looking at the cell-free DNA in patients who are at high risk of developing cancers, so patients who have these hereditary cancer syndromes. Um, and we are a research initiative across Canada. So we charm the um, study is led out of UHN, specifically Princess Margaret. Um, at UHN, Dr. Raymond Kim, who's a um, medical geneticist or genetics doctor, um, leads the clinical side of charm. And then there's Dr. Trevor Pugh, who's a research scientist um, at Princess Margaret, and he leads the academic side. So his team really leads the development of the blood test technology um, in his lab at Princess Margaret. Um, but as you can see in the image here, we recruit patients with hereditary syndromes really all across Canada. Um, so we have sites in BC um, and BC Cancer. Um, in Ontario, we're at, out of sick kids. We have patients, um, UHN, of course, Mount Sinai, Women's College. Um, in Quebec, we um, have a site at Jewish General Hospital. And then on the East Coast, we have Eastern Health at Nova Scotia and then IW Health at, uh, in Newfoundland. So the goal of CHARM, um, really the main goal is to develop a blood test um, for early cancer detection, like I said, in patients who are at high risk, so who have these hereditary cancer syndromes by analyzing their cell-free DNA. Um, one thing that, again, I want to stress, I know I stressed this at the beginning, is that while the patient population that we work with are patients with um, high risk of cancer, so these patients with these hereditary cancer syndromes, um, everything we really learn is very much applicable to patients who, um, every other patient who, um, you know, develops sporadic cancer. So what we learn is not just applicable to our patient population. We hope that kind of over time um, it, it be, is used and more applicable with everybody else. So what has CHARM looked like to date? And then I'll talk a little bit about the trial and how things are changing. Um, so to date, we've recruited um, over 2,000 patients across Canada with a variety of different hereditary cancer syndromes. Um, we've recruited a lot of patients with hereditary breast and ovarian cancer um, syndrome, but also many others. So we collect blood, oh, I'm sorry, my apologies. We collect, um, blood samples from these patients every six months to a year or so. Um, for some participants who've been with us for five, six years, we've been collecting blood samples for that long. For other participants um, who've enrolled more recently, we maybe have collected about one or two samples, but we're continuing to collect. Um, and what we do is we collect these samples, we process them, or we process the blood. So really what that means is we spin the blood really, really fast um, to separate what we call the plasma away from the red blood cells at the bottom. And the plasma is where all that cell-free DNA is. So we want to separate that because that's ultimately what we want to look at and analyze. Um, once we separate or once we process the blood, we bank the sample. So we have created this CHARM um, consortium biobank, which stores all these samples at UHN. Um, and these samples are stored together with a lot of the patient's clinical information. So we really want to know what cancer syndrome do they have? What's their cancer syndrome, uh, cancer history? When we collect their blood samples, um, do they have an active cancer diagnosis? Do they not? Uh, so these are all things that are really important for us to know when um, developing our, our blood test. And um, periodically we go into our biobank, we take a bunch of samples, um, and we analyze, we sequence that cell-free DNA, and we look to see, is there any evidence that there is cell-free DNA that's coming from a tumor? Or does all the cell-free DNA look like it's coming from healthy, normal cells? 
Um, if we see anything or historically, if we've seen anything suspicious in the patient's blood, so see like, oh, there might be something that looks like it's coming from cancer. Um, we then go into the patient's clinical records. So we look at their screening, their MRIs, their mammograms, their colonoscopies to see if any of their clinical screening is also showing cancer or not. So having a lot of the clinical information has been really important for us when developing this blood test to know if it's accurate or if it's not. Um, so I've said this, I think, multiple times up until this point, but really overall, um, up until now, our goal has been the development of um, this blood test. And it has been tricky. It has not been super straightforward. Um, the difficult part of the, the blood test development has really has been really trying to understand, well, what, what markers, what characteristics of cell-free DNA make us really suspicious that there might be cancer? Um, because again, most of the cell-free DNA in our blood is from healthy cells. So we really have to look hard to find things that are, find something that looks like it's coming from a cancer. And so some of the things we look at is, for example, how long each piece of DNA is. So we know that the cell-free DNA coming from cancer cells is actually a little bit shorter on average than cell-free DNA coming from healthy cells. Um, we also look at the spelling of cell-free DNA. So DNA is spelled just like a sentence. And we look through that uh, spelling of these cell-free DNA pieces to look to see if there are any spelling mistakes that suggest there might be a cancer present. And then I'm not going to go into this into too much detail, but we look at something called methylation, which really just means it's like a flag or a marker on the DNA. Um, and there are certain patterns of this marker, certain patterns of this flag that tend to be more likely associated with cancer. Um, so the point really, again, I want to highlight is that the development of this test um, really has been a work in progress. And over the past few years, really what we focused on is trying to figure out what features, what characteristics of the cell-free DNA um, is a really good kind of solid, strong marker of cancer. Um, so if we see this feature in someone's blood, then we think, okay, there might be cancer present, maybe we should follow up. And so very briefly, um, I know this slide is uh, a, a little bit confusing, so I'm not gonna delve into, into too much detail, but I did just wanna give an example of what a result has looked like to date. Um, so this is a patient who has a pediatric patient um, who has a syndrome called leaf Raumini syndrome. So it's a different hereditary cancer syndrome. Um, and the risks for leaf Raumini syndrome um, for the cancer risk, sorry, start really right from infancy. So patients um, at a very young age are enrolled in quite intensive screening programs. Um, and so um, on the left on the slide here, uh, I'm just showing the results of the blood test, the results of all our cell-free DNA analysis. And then on the right, I'm showing the results of clinical cancer screening. In this case, it's the results of a whole body MRI. Um, and the dashed line in the graph just shows kind of the cutoff at which we can detect whether cancer is present or not based on the cell-free DNA. Um, so if you focus on the line at 28 months, when we analyzed and looked at the cell-free DNA in this kiddo's blood, we didn't see any signs of cancer in the cell-free DNA. And then when we compared that to this uh, patient's whole body MRI, similarly, didn't see any evidence of cancer. So those results were consistent. Um, but then we took a look at cell-free DNA in the next blood um, uh, sample that was collected at 32 months and I think around 34 months. Um, and based on the cell-free DNA, you can see in red, we started to see evidence of cancer. Now with clinical screening, which again is the whole body MRI, we only picked up the clinical evidence of cancer at about 39 months. Um, so with the blood test, we were able to find it about for a little over four months earlier. Um, and as you probably know, the earlier you find the cancer, really the better it is for treatment or prognosis and outcomes. So um, even if it's just a few months earlier, it can make quite the difference. So that's all I'm going to say about the results. I hope that was clear, um, but again, happy to answer any questions or elaborate um, on this at the end. Um, one final thing I want to say about um, the results and just charm to date is that we've been what we call retrospective, um, which just means that we've not returned any results to patients. Um, so our goal was really test development and just trying to figure out and understand, does our technology even work? And so now the big change that we're moving um, or the big change that's happening within CHARM is that um, we're moving towards implementing a study in more of a clinical context. So um, we will become what we call prospective, 
um, meaning that we plan to collect blood samples from patients, analyze the results, so analyze the cell-free DNA in real time, and then return um, those results really as soon as possible for the lab to analyze them, so as soon as we can to the participants and their doctors for appropriate follow-up. So just a little bit more about the design of our trial. Um, we plan to recruit um, a thousand patients across Canada. Um, so all participants for the trial will have to have one of the five hereditary cancer syndromes I've listed on the slide here. So apologies, one of them is um, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome. And then there are some other syndromes as well. Um, all participants, um, once they're enrolled, will be randomly um, put into or assigned into one of two groups. Um, there is the control group and then the experimental group. Um, all 1,000 participants will continue to receive their standard uh, of care clinical routine cancer screening. So their mammograms, their colonoscopies, that will all continue over the course of the trial for all patients. Um, and also all 1,000 participants will provide blood samples three times a year. So every four months, um, we'll collect a blood sample for four years. So blood samples that are collected from participants in the control group, um, those blood samples will not be analyzed. So rather, we're going to store them within our um, biobank for use in future research. So for example, future research at making the test better. Um, it's really helpful to have samples banked. Um, and then blood samples collected from participants in the experimental group will be analyzed. Um, so their cell-free DNA will be looked at in real time. And then those results are going to be returned to the uh, patient by the study team. And really our goal is to understand um, whether, well, basically understand the performance of our blood test and whether um, we're able to detect cancer more frequently in the experimental group who's receiving both blood tests um, as well as standard of care clinical screening for cancer compared to the control group who's only receiving the clinical screening for cancer. Um, so in addition to determining how frequently cancer is going to be detected in either group, we really wanna understand what types of cancer are being detected. So is our blood test better able at detecting certain types of cancer over others? Um, we wanna compare the stage at which cancer is being detected, how long it takes patients to access treatment for that cancer. Um, once they do access treatment, how long are patients on treatment and in general outcomes of the cancer. We do also have a qualitative arm of the study where really we want to hear from patients, uh, from our participants and understand how this blood test is really impacting their well-being. So at different points, uh, time points in the study, participants will complete um, questionnaires that assess a variety of different um, emotional outcomes. So things like anxiety, cancer risk perception, cancer worry, um, empowerment, things like this. Um, and we do also plan to, uh, once the trial is up and running, of course, we want to interview some of our participants as well to really learn more about what's their experience with the blood test, both the good and the bad. So we really wanna understand what do patients feel about how this blood test should be implemented? How frequently um, are they comfortable with doing a blood test like this? How should results of this blood test be communicated? Things like this. And we have a really lovely group of patient advocates who are working with us very closely to help us develop this questionnaire, um, as well as the structure um, of the interviews, what questions we should ask, things like this. Um, so the last few minutes, just a little bit more about kind of the practicalities of the study, um, of this trial, what does it involve, what will participation really look like? Um, so I mentioned that participants will provide blood samples every four months. When possible, we're going to collect these blood samples at the time that patients might be doing any clinical blood work already, um, or if a patient is coming into the hospital for any imaging. Uh, for example, we'll collect the blood work then. Um, but at other times, we're not going to ask our participants to come all the way into the hospital, especially if they live far away. Um, so we have partnerships with Life Labs and Dynacare so that patients can give blood at a community blood lab closer to home. Um, also, like I mentioned a couple of slides ago, um, for participants in the experimental group, we're going to analyze the results and give them back. So we're going to look at uh, to see if we see any cancer signal and return those results to the patient. So the study team, once we get the results back, we will give the patient a call with each result and the result will either be cancer signal, signal not detected, so a negative result, um, and most results will be negative. 
um, or the result could be a cancer signal detected or a positive result. And so in addition to a phone call, we're going to provide participants with a kind of a result info sheet um, this is a preliminary example of one uh, for a negative result. We haven't finalized these, but it'll be something like this, um, where we kind of go over what does the result mean, next steps, um, just also a little bit of information about cell-free DNA, since it's becoming more and more of a popular tool. So I think it's helpful for patients to be a little bit familiar. Um, one thing that we, well, there's a few things we really want to stress when we return results to patients. So one thing we need to stress is that it's an experimental blood test. Um, and it absolutely should not replace any sort of routine cancer screening that patient is having. Um, because it's an experimental test, a negative result does not rule out cancer. Um, and similarly, a positive result does not confirm cancer. So um, there's very much a chance for something we can call a, or we do call a false negative, uh, which just means that the blood test result is negative, but actually cancer is present. The test just didn't pick it up. And then on the flip side, there's a chance for something called a false positive, meaning that the blood test is positive, but cancer isn't actually present. So these are really important considerations that patients um, will absolutely need to be made aware of, both when they enroll in the trial, um, but also at the time they are getting back results. We really want to make sure that patients are still paying attention to symptoms, are still complying with all their regular routine screening. Um, that's really important. Um, and then while most results um, we do expect will be negative, so there would be no follow-up done by the um, study team, um, if the blood test result is positive or you know, cancer signal detected, um, the study doctor would then bring the patient in, um, bring them in for a clinical exam, take a history, um, and discuss next steps that would be needed to confirm is cancer in fact present or not. Because again, it's an experimental test, so it can't tell us definitively if cancer is present or not. Um, so again, because there is that chance of a false positive, we really do need those subsequent investigations to confirm if it's present. And the investigations would be based on the specific cancer syndrome. So for example, if a patient has hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, um, then the follow-up investigations would include things like a mammogram or a breast MRI um, and other imaging to look for the cancers that I listed before. And it would be a stepwise process. So we, the, the doctor would start with um, the highest risk cancers first, rule those out, and then kind of go looking at the less common cancers. So what's next um, for our trial from a logistics standpoint, we're still sorting out quite a few things. Um, it gets a little bit complicated by the fact that we're across Canada and um, really between provinces, there's a lot of difference in terms of access to community blood labs, um, even access to imaging. So, you know, if in the follow-up we want to do a certain type of imaging test, um, it might not be accessible in all provinces. So there's a lot of differences that we're still trying to sort out. Um, and uh, of course, every study has to go through an ethics review and approval at every institution. So that's kind of what we're doing now in the process of getting at UHM and Princess Margaret. And we're really hoping to get the trial up and running sometime in the next maybe six months of next year. So the first half of next year. Um, and we'll likely start in Ontario first and do um, sort of like a mini trial run um, to work out any issues, any problems that we come across. And then we would expand to other provinces. So now I went through a lot of information. I hope that was all clear, but of course, um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions either in this format, but again, I have put my email here. Um, if anyone's just more comfortable shooting me an email, um, I'm happy to answer questions that way too. And then I put um, our charm email um, as well as the link to our website um, to get any sort of updates about the trial or any sort of news around charm, if that's of interest. Um, but yes, thank you very much for listening and bearing with me on an evening. Um, I really appreciate it. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Julia. That was uh, very interesting and exciting that you're ready to move to the clinical phase of this study. So I had a question. Will you be looking at any of the past samples starting this clinical phase or all new? Yeah, good, very good question. So all new, um, we do still have remaining past samples that we haven't looked at, um, but likely those will be used for kind of further test development um, if we need them in the future. Um, but this will be fully kind of from scratch. So 
um, patients that are eligible for this trial are not necessarily patients who had to participate in the first phase of CHARM. And in the past CHARM, they can be new participants that have never um, had anything to do with the study to date. Okay. Um, another question we had, will the BRIP1 gene qualify for one of the thousand recruits for your study? I am very sorry to say it will not. Um, so that is not one of our um, uh, patient populations. And the main reason for that is because um, it's a less common gene or it's a less common, um, yeah, I guess the best way to say is a less common gene. So um, the individuals we've chosen to recruit for the trial are people who really we've collected quite a few samples for already and we've analyzed and done, done a lot of work with their blood already to look for cancer. So we have kind of a good understanding of what to look for because there are some differences between different syndromes. Um, that's not to say, you know, once this test is up and running and, and again, everything we learn from it will long-term be applicable to everyone. So all the different cancer syndromes, uh, we know it'll eventually be applicable to there, to all of those, as well as patients with sporadic cancers. So um, there is hope for that, but unfortunately, uh, at least for the trial, that is not uh, a patient population that would be eligible. Okay, thank you. Um, we had another question come in actually before the presentation. Can cell-free DNA sequencing be used to detect the recurrence of ovarian cancer? Yes, so the answer is a very good question. Um, and the answer is yes, so it can, um, absolutely. It's and patients who will be eligible for our trial um, must be kind of at the time they start of the trial must be cancer free for a minimum of three years. Um, but some of our some of the patients who will join will have had a history of cancer and very likely because we have a lot of a big population of breast and ovarian cancer syndrome patients, likely some of them will have had a history of ovarian cancer. Um, and so it's possible that over the course of the trial, um, we might detect ovarian cancer recurrence in those patients. Interesting. That's that's uh, excellent news too. Um, so I had a qu another question here. So we'll participate. You showed a map of where the um, locations were. Now, will people be able to participate? Obviously, if they're not from those locations, and just send in the blood test, or how does that work? It'll be tricky. So patients will have to um, have been seen at at one of the participating hospitals. So for example, in Ontario, patients would have had to be a patient at UHN or SickKids or Sunnybrook is another institution that I don't think was on the map or Mount Sinai. So they will have to have been patients there. Um, the reason in part is because um, if a patient um, is found to be positive, they'll have to come into the hospital for follow-up and all of that. So they really have to be um, at least able to come to the hospital and but very likely for kind of logistical reasons will likely have had to or have to have what we call an MRN or a medical record number and all of that with the individual hospitals that are participating. Um, so unfortunately, it wouldn't be every single um, hospital that's eligible. It's usually one per province. In Ontario, we have quite a few, but um, in other provinces, it's one hospital um, in each. Okay, so there is one in each province, though. I didn't see on the map a little circle in each province, but there... Oh, that's a good point. Only in those provinces where, um, so BC, um, Ontario, uh, Quebec, Newfoundland, and Nova Scotia. So we don't have anything really in the prairies, unfortunately. We did try when we started CHARM, we tried to recruit and, and get um, a site up and going in uh, Manitoba. Um, but staffing in genetics clinics is not the great and not the best. So there's a lot of staffing issues and it was just really hard to get them uh, on board. Um, maybe that'll change in the future, but right now we don't really have good representation from the prairies. Okay, thank or you. Northern Canada. Um, okay, another question that just came in here. Are there any other cell-free DNA tests already available for this group of people? Or are you the first one? Um, so not for... So I, it's hard for me to comment um, within this group of people. I know there is, um, out of actually UHN, um, there is, the company is called Grail, I believe. Um, I could be mistaken, but Grail, who um, are doing also self free DNA testing. Their technology is a little bit different, but they're also doing a clinical trial um, for patients who don't have hereditary cancer syndromes. And I I don't know the eligibility criteria. So I believe their patients were older, so they have to be over 50 or 60 years old. 
Um, so they have slightly different eligibility criteria. Um, the study is called Pathfinder. So if anyone is interested and can Google that, um, they work with a different patient population and the technology is a little bit different. So what they look at in the cell free DNA is a little bit different, um, but the premise is absolutely the same. So we're definitely not the only group to be working on it. It's um, quite a popular tool and I think shows a lot of promise. So hopefully, and it's great, the more groups look at it, the more, um, they develop the technology kind of working together at the end is the best. So if anyone's interested, um, Pathfinder 2, I think, is the stage they're at. And I believe the um, company is called Braille. And I know out of UHN, they're doing a clinical trial. I don't know if you're, what other hospitals. I know they're worldwide. So I know in the UK as well, they're doing something. But that's if anyone's interested. Okay, thanks. And, and I love the collaboration there too. Um, okay, I have another comment here. And it's I'm assuming risk reduction salpingo-oophorectomy will still be recommended while waiting for this test to be proven to be effective for HBOC patients. However, then surgery would prevent the ability to see if it works to screen for ovarian cancer. Very, that's a very good question. So um, that, we, that's uh, coming study... from our nurse practitioner in Winnipeg. I mean, it's a very good question. Um, so a couple of things. Um, so for our trial, we're not actually going to be restrictive with who we recruit. So patients who've had prophylactic surgery um, are still absolutely eligible, in part because these patients are at risk for multiple different types of cancer. So if they've had prophylactic surgery, for example, for ovarian cancer, they're still at risk for many others or a few others in the case of breast and ovarian cancer. Um, and then the second thing is depending on, um, and you know, I say this with a grain of salt because I'm not a physician and, and especially a surgeon. Um, but typically um, what I always see here is that surgeries, surgeons perform surgeries very differently and sometimes more or less tissue is left behind. So when someone has, for example, a mastectomy to have their breast removed, that doesn't reduce the breast cancer risk to zero. There's still a small, you know, it could be anywhere from one to 5%. I don't want to give an exact number, but there is still a small breast cancer risk even after the surgery. And I imagine, it, I would imagine it's similar with ovarian cancer, though I'm not as sure with that group or with that cancer. Uh, but so those are kind of the two reasons we're not restrictive and we're still going to be recruiting. Um, and it will be interesting, um, you know, for patients who've had a, a prophylactic surgery to remove their ovaries, what do we see on their self free DNA? Do we see any signal of ovarian cancer? And that actually will give us quite valuable information as well. Okay, great. Couple more questions. They're rolling in now, Julia. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to share too that we have lots of comments in the chat. I don't know if you've been able to read them on this excellent presentation. And thank you for the great work that you're all doing. So that's come through several times, and I just wanted to pass that on to you. Um, okay, so next question. So thank you for the presentation. So this woman is just understand wanting to understand correctly. If she's had it confirmed that her ovarian cancer was sporadic. Does that mean her daughter's lifetime risk is not elevated? Um, so that's a little bit complicated. I think um, with genetic testing, we never say it's hard when we, when genetic testing comes back as negative. So you have a test, for example, looking at BRCA1 and 2, and now actually the, there's quite a few other genes that are tested for when someone has breast and ovarian cancer. When that test comes back as negative, so meaning nothing was found that suggests a hereditary cause of cancer, um, it greatly reduces the risk that there is a hereditary cause, but we can never say zero, definitely sporadic, just because there's a lot we're still learning. So even the technology in the clinical setting, when you do genetic counseling, uh, genetic testing, sorry, the technology is not perfect. It can miss things. Um, and we're also learning more and more about new genes that might be involved in these hereditary cancer syndromes. So um, it greatly reduces your risk. And um, it means that it's much less likely that you've passed on anything to your daughter and her risk would likely be um, the general population risk. Um, but we're always very hesitant to say, no, the, you know, it's 100% um, definitive. It's definitely erratic. We don't want to say that. Great. But it, hopefully the results are reassuring um, that the risk is uh, significantly less. Perfect. Um, okay, one final question I see here now. Um, are there any trials or tests looking for circulating tumor cells for ovarian cancer screening or recurrence. And thank you for the fantastic presentation. 
Um, so other than ours, so we would, well, I guess, I mean, we're, we're looking at ovarian cancer, but um, in a very specific patient population, um, kind of in terms of a broader patient population, um, the only one I can think of is Pathfinder with Grail, where um, you are eligible if you have a history of cancer and they are looking at uh, circulating tumor DNA, uh, which is for anyone else, it's another way of saying cell-free DNA coming from tumors, circulating tumor DNA. Um, so Grail, the Pathfinder 2 study, um, I don't want to comment too much about their eligibility because I really don't know. Um, but I know, I'm pretty sure you can have had a history of cancer, but again, it has to be a distant history and it's, they have age restrictions. So it's over, I believe 50 years old. Um, other than that, I'm not totally familiar. Um, there is, I think it's clinicaltrials.gov. Uh, I believe that's the website where you can look up all the clinical trials that are running. Yeah. So if you go into there and put in cell-free DNA or circulating tumor DNA or, you know, cancer screening, ovarian cancer, um, it would be my kind of where I would start if I was curious. Okay. Excellent. So thank you. That's all the questions. Well, almost all of the questions, I guess, finally, um, as you're recruiting patients, there may be, um, people on the webinar tonight that are eligible and want to be involved. Should they contact you or Marianne's put your email in the chat? Absolutely. So feel free to contact me, either my email or the charm email. Um, the website will also, once we are up and running, there'll be information on the website. Um, so you can take a look there as well. It'll be a little while, but um, we'll keep that up to date for everyone. Okay, excellent. I want to thank you again, Julia, for that informative presentation. Um, everything was very clear and I understood everything and it was really well presented. So thank you so much. And uh, we will look forward to connecting with you in the next six months to a year to find out uh, if the trial's up and, and how it's going as well. So thank you again for uh, sharing your thank expertise you. in your evening with us tonight.